Okay. So in thinking about uh, what we're going to talk about as a group today, knowing that a lot of we're representing a lot of different institutions, a lot of different specialties and disciplines. I thought one of the lessons that I could share is my has been my own personal experience with moving between institutions. There, I think this is a topic that can lead to a lot of anxiety and consternation, both in making the decision to move and then once that decision is made, trying to figure out how to be productive, happy, um, and maintain positive connections across across institutions. So what I'm going to do in this in this uh, brief introduction is to share my story, talk about actually some of the advantages of moving between institutions. This is not all doom and gloom, despite what you may hear or fear, and then try to identify some of the best practices that we might use to maintain that productivity and relationships during the move. Um, I'm happy to take questions during, but I won't be able to see the chat, I don't think, from my screen. So um, starting off, I don't know if this is necessarily a confession, but I think it's certainly something that we worry about in academics, about making decisions to move based on personal reasons. And for me, all of my moves have been personal. Um, so I am the lagging spouse of a, um, of a person that I met in medical school who is, a, who is trained now as a general surgeon. And because of differences in training, differences in military obligation, and now a decision to return to training, I've moved three times. And I'll show, tell you a little bit what that is. So this is from our first year of our relationship in 2006. And since then, now 16 years later, lots of great things have happened. But the reality is we've been in and out of suitcases, in and out of institutions and states in, in um, ways that have actually been, I have to say, very good. So I grew up in Minnesota. I went to University of Iowa for college, which is only about 300 miles. I thought I would probably go to medical school in the Midwest, um, but wasn't exactly sure. I was a rower at Iowa and at, um, at the end of my rowing career, I had an opportunity to coach rowing and work in a lab in San Diego for the year. So I was accepted to medical school in New York City by this point, but uh, when the letter came through that said I could take a deferral if I would like, I thought this is a great opportunity for me to do something different. So I spent a year in San Diego learning to surf, working in a pain um, pharmacology lab, and really just being an adult without college supervision, without coach supervision for the first time. After that year, I moved to New York City where I completed medical school, residency, clinical fellowship and research fellowship, and then worked on faculty for a couple of years. I'll tell you more about those experiences, but New York for me was the place where I felt like really an adult and the place where I felt most happy and sort of what I thought of the paradigm of what I wanted my future life to be. Uh, at the end of my partner's time in residency training to fulfill a military commitment, however, we moved to San Antonio, Texas, which was the place where I met Rory Allison and, and the rest of the Ray's Echo team. I'll talk more about those experiences there, but I spent about three years in San Antonio before my partner separated from the military, started uh, fellowship training at University of Pennsylvania, and then we moved again. So lots of cross-country moves. And I think this is more common than not in medicine. So people certainly do stay in the same institution for their whole career. That's a paradigm that I think especially lots of senior folks will, will describe. And there's a lot of certain, there are definitely advantages to that model, but it's also not realistic because of um, interprofessional relationships, because of personal and family relationships, you may find yourself having to move. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it's something that hopefully with new generations of leaders is something that's more accepted. So what this looked like for me. So as I mentioned before, Columbia was really the place where I became a doctor. So it's where I did all my clinical training. It's where I got board certified. I got a master's degree in clinical research. I was part of the Virginia Apgar Society, which is a one of the, the early anesthesia clinical research or anesthesia research societies um, and to which I maintain important relationships. It's a place where I fell in love with New York City. I made lifelong friends and um, really developed my identity as, as a doctor. Probably the most important thing that happened to me at Columbia, the mo two most important things that happened, one is I learned the power of mentorship. So I was surrounded by people who I wanted to be when I grew up, um, surrounded by people who were willing to, to support and sponsor and mentor me, both formally and informally in ways that I found both validating and productive. It's also where I learned about the power of women as representatives. So anesthesia traditionally is a underrepresented, women are underrepresented in that specialty. Something like 30 to 40% of US anesthesiologists are women. But in, in that department, 
our chair was a woman, the residency program director was a woman, several of the division directors and fellowship directors were women. So I didn't have any sense as a resident, as a trainee, that women were underrepresented in my field. And I think that was important both because it allowed me to find gender specific mentors, but also because it didn't limit me to this perception that this was gonna be difficult or challenging or that I couldn't, I couldn't um, be the person that I wanted to be. So some of the mentors that uh, have been important now throughout my career were people, relationships that I formed at, at um, Columbia. And on the far right is Vivek Moitra, who has been a raise echo speaker and panelist, remains an important mentor to me, both in the clinical space, but also really thinking about questions of leadership um, and efficacy uh, in the team space and, and honestly in personal happiness. So a lot of what I talk about with Vivek is, am I happy? Could I do something better? What things are necessary? And really challenging some of my assumptions about what is necessary for me to have a helpful and fulfilling career. The person on the left is Hannah Wunsch, who's an intensivist who, who started her career at Columbia. And in 2014, when I was still in training, despite us working together closely, decided to move to the University of Toronto. So I learned from here, her some of the best practices for moving and happy to say that we've maintained a mentoring relationship across now countries, institutions, a sabbatical for her, um, and still continue to write papers together and do work that, that I think is really fulfilling for me and, and hopefully satisfying for her. One of Hannah's trainees and, and former mentees is Haley Gershengorn, who was at Columbia for briefly before I was, and then moved subsequently um, to Montefiore in New York and then to University of Miami. I saw how her moves went, I thought that was important for her how she quickly rose the ladder at the University of Miami. Again, someone who I continue to collaborate with. I, what I like about Hannah and Vivek is that they're very open to collaboration. I think that's another value that I learned from, from their mentorship is there's nothing wrong with pulling in someone from another institution who has specific skills or interests or just nice people that they like to work with and have worked with um, productively and never once said to me, you know, why are you reaching out to Haley? Why are you doing this project with her and not me? Really trying to keep the doors open. Alan Walkie is one of those people. So I've probably met him in person two times at, at professional society meetings, but he's a person who is a mentor to Hannah and a collaborator, both Hannah and Haley, with whom I continue to work closely. And now I work with some of his mentees. So one of the advantages of these moves now is with email communication, with Zoom, it's really possible to have really productive collaborations, research and otherwise, without having a physical personal relationship or an office that's adjacent. So thinking about what I, what I gained from Columbia, as I mentioned, some of the, the diplomas and things that really are necessary to start your career, the mentorship, professional connections, and really that culture of academia that I mentioned, this idea that collaboration is really powerful. I have since learned that that's not a, um, that, that is sometimes uncommon or is not a universal value in academia, but something that the, the people I was lucky enough to work with at Columbia um, really valued and it's really informed how I do my work. In fact, I've actually gotten feedback from other mentors and collaborators that I'm too collaborative. And I'm happy to take that feedback, but I've never yet regretted having more people take, put eyes on a project to try to make it better, even if it slows things down. So I left Columbia in 2017, uh, at, as I said, at the time that my, uh, my boyfriend started uh, a military job in San Antonio. There are lots of reasons for me to move. Um, I had been at Columbia for 11 years. I was still treated by the nursing staff like I was a medical student. In fact, some of them would say to me in the ICU, I remember when you were a medical student, made it a little hard to feel effective at work. And it wasn't clear to me how quickly I would advance um, within the institution and the department. Uh, we had also had a new chair. Some of the rules of engagement, some of the rules of support were different for a junior investigator. And I thought maybe it was a time for me to, to, to um, make a change. So I left Columbia thinking that I would be joining a similar institution in a different, maybe warmer environment. In fact, what I found is a very, very different institution. So um, as many of you probably know, University of Texas Health San Antonio is a large medical, uh, MD medical school. They have lots of different resources. Their real focus is on clinical training. They have lots of residency programs, um, but different state, different culture, different institutional values that made it very hard for me to transition. And I would say the biggest challenge for me that I faced in my first few years there was isolation. So the things that I thought were important outside of patient care. So again, everyone you know, um, in both places cared about providing excellent care to their patients. But at the end of the day, there wasn't anyone in the OR space where I was working that was interested in my ideas, 
wanted to collaborate on projects or frankly had the resources and the skills to do this. And this came to light when I um, approached the, the current department chair and asked if I could apply for a KL2 program, which is available through the institution, but hadn't been used in the department. And the response was that I could do it or I could think about applying, but it would probably not be a very convincing um, story of mentorship if, if I wasn't collaborating with anyone at the institution. Um, I've talked about this in other talks, and this is not specifically a criticism of UTL San Antonio, but just to acknowledge that many of us feel isolated in many different ways. This can be within a department or division, this can be within a role, within an institution, within specialty or within expertise. This comes up in Ray's Echo all the time. I'm the only person, I'm the only electron microscoper in my institution that doesn't want to buy me a new, a new piece of equipment, or I'm the only person in my specialty who's doing pediatric cardiac surgery or I'm the only woman in my division, or I'm the only person who's been asked to do this and that. So that isolation, whether it's because of institutional culture, resources, values, or just the makeup of the people that you're working with can be a very um, challenging thing to, to try to overcome. In because of that isolation, oh, so over time, I think that isolation got better. One, I got to know my clinical colleagues better. Two, I maintained ongoing research collaborations. I had more time because of the structure to be more involved in some professional societies. And at, once I recognized that isolation was a problem and one of my fr friends from Columbia endorsed the AAMC Early Faculty Women um, uh, Workshop Program, I, a lot of doors were opened up. So I attended that program in 2018. That's where I met Rory Allison and Ray's Echo was an outgrowth of our experience there. Um, the other things that over time I learned, uh, it, knowing that they didn't have the same resources there, especially for, for early research career development, there was an opportunity for me to become a program director when there was an additional change in chair leadership. And so for about a year and a half until I left Yeska, I was the clinical um, critical care fellowship program director. What I learned from that is that it's not a job I'd ever want to do again. But it was helpful to understand some of the institutional structures in place, some of the challenges that, those, that people in those roles face, and to decide that it wasn't a good fit for me. So again, coming back to this idea of the suitcase, things that I added to the suitcase from Utesca, I became an oral board examiner, which is um, for anesthesiologists is an important role and some, another way to build professional connections. I got that role not because of any specific research or anything that I'd done, but because of connections I made with other Utesca leaders who had previously served in ABA leadership positions. As I mentioned, the fellowship program director, um, the Raise Echo program that we started um, in the, the uh, first as a series of dinners and social events within UTESCA. And then as the pandemic evolved and we got more comfortable with Zoom into something that you see today, professional connections were strengthened and certainly clinical experience was strengthened. So even though I come from a you know, major quaternary care institution, we were seeing different patients in San Antonio, trauma patients, advanced head and neck cancer patients that had allowed me to gain some clinical experience. I knew that UTESCO was not gonna be a long-term fit for me in part because Texas was too hot. I had anaphylaxis to fire ants. I couldn't exercise outside. Um, I didn't like to be in the car. So for all these reasons, it made sense to me or I was looking forward to an opportunity to move back to the Northeast, even though I was much happier when I left UTESCO than when I, than when I started. So uh, when uh, we were making a rank list to move again, uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania became a clear, a clear front runner for, for that, was both, that was mutually agreeable for both of us. I specifically sought and obtained a clinical research position. So the institution is so big with so many faculty doing so many different things that they actually hire people to do research. And that was a, a major departure from my last two jobs. It was a place where I was able to secure for the first time my own extramural funding to learn project mentorship and management, to, um, to lead an academic center, and to, to take specific classes and skills to better disseminate my research. I became an editorial fellow for the British Journal of Anesthesia. And then last year, I was, I was appointed the president of the Women in Anesthesia Group. I couldn't have done any of those things without mentorship. And one of the, the key parts of that pen that was important to me is that I came into the institution knowing that I wanted to work with these two people, uh, Megan Lane Falk, who's also been a Ray's Echo speaker, and Mark Newman, both who have track records of, of um, clinical research mentorship and track records of their own funding. Had I left Columbia at the time that I moved to UTESCA, I, would, I don't think that I would have asked the same questions or found the right people to help me continue to do the work. So that's a lot about me. I think the, the some of the takeaways that I'd like to share with you, one, 
there are a lot of unexpected benefits in moving. So as I mentioned before, different relationships with clinical staff, with nurses, moving institutions allows you to renegotiate that role. I could come to Penn and say, I don't want to be involved in GME anymore. I'd like to, I'd like to manage residents. I'd like to work with fellows, but I don't want to be responsible for their education. I don't want to sign their diploma or frankly discipline them when there's issues. Um, it's an opportunity to sort of reset what you're expected to do, negotiate for how many weeks on service or how, um, what exactly where your clinical space is going to be. And I was shocked, even in San Antonio, when I showed up there, I was two years out of clinical training. They considered me an expert. I, I came with a different set of skills, a different set of practices that some, some people thought were crazy, some people thought were innovative, but there's so much, um, so much institutional practice that is not evidence-based that is sort of passed on that people who come with a different perspective about how things should be or can, who can look at the problems in a slightly different way are often in, you know, are hopefully people that are looked, looked on as experts and innovators and, and really um, and valued by, by the new institution. In some cases, it was also an opportunity to reset my promotion clock. So I was on track for promotion at UTESCA. When I moved to Penn before, before being promoted, I had the opportunity to reset my clock. Penn is an upper out system for the track that I'm in. And so effectively I got five years of work done and now have an additional nine years before, before I'm reconsidered. That's not always available, but that was nice for me to build my, continue to build my CV and have more time to do that work. And certainly expanding my professional network. So in a given week, I'm still working with people from Columbia, people who have moved on from Columbia, people who worked on, moved on from UTESCA, people who are still at UTESCA. And those networks continue to grow over time. And, and the last thing I'll say about that networking is I've found my perception of what that means to be to change. So from the first sort of junior faculty or resident sort of experiences where you show up at the professional society networking event and maybe shake some hands and say, hello, I'm so-and-so, I wanna do this work. I haven't found as meaningful connections in that as people who I've been able to sustain working relationships with. And that concept of networking came directly from my experiences in San Antonio. So what does this look like? I, I'm not an expert in negotiation. I recognize that, that making these decisions can be really difficult, but what the advice that I've gotten over time and I think makes sense is to always be open to the possibility of moves. This, this certainty that you can be at the same institution your whole career, is predicated on the fact, uh, predicated on consistent patient populations, consistent funding, consistent leadership, cons consistent organizational structures, and none of those things are certain in academics and medicine um, at, at this time. And so, at, at least being open to the possibility should ensure that if change has to happen, you're ready. This means making sure that people know who you are in small ways and big ways. If your LinkedIn profile is three years old, six years old, it says you're at a different institution, doesn't have the same titles, you may be less likely to be approached for jobs, or as soon as you make a phone call to someone to say, I am interested in the position, they will look at LinkedIn. Many of the letters you send to a chair will be screened by their administrative staff, and they use all the tools available to them, Twitter, LinkedIn, Doximity, to, to at least get a sense of whether like you are who you say you are, or to say whether your roles um, would be aligned with what their, what their needs are. And sometimes people will make a professional profile page or, or even the profile page at your own institution, keeping it up to date means that you're easier to find. Moving between states is always frustrating and for medical licensure or other licensure, those processes can be delayed. So as soon as there's a possibility that you may be moving, getting that license started soon. And then I always maintain my New York license. I've since let, let my Texas license lapse, but New York was sufficiently difficult to obtain. It's not that expensive and the renewal process is not um, burdensome, and as it's a place that I might consider living in the future, I've kept that one as well as my Pennsylvania. The institutional CV that you send out is almost never the CV that, that the new institution wants you to have. So what I do is try to maintain those things in parallel, keeping an AAMC formatted CV up to date at all times. And for people who are also educators, keeping a similar educational portfolio of your work that you are ready to share as soon as an offer comes through, or as soon as you're even thinking about making a change. Uh, once you've made the decision to move, being really clear with your research teams, if research is a part of your career or um, the other parts of your staff, what archives, what files you can take, what things need to be stored and how, whether there's someone at, the, at your old institution who can still have access to those files or what things the IRB needs you to destroy. I've maintained a continuity email address. So emilyvalemd at Gmail has been an email address for me 
professional email from address for me for 15 years for things like license renewals across states, for DEA licenses, for um, CME, for professional society memberships, things that expect to outlast institutional um, participation, or for those times where you have gaps between between roles, having an email address that people can consistently reach you at, something you can put in your signature line, I'll be leaving, but you can reach me at this, um, this institution or this address has been really helpful for me. And I think also maintaining those relationships. I would not have the career I, I have without continued mentorship from the people that have been really impactful. And frankly, being able to leave some people who are de facto mentors or, or uh, mentors who your relationships have changed with over time, Moving institutions allows you to set, reset or change those expectations. That can happen with collaborators or trainees too. If you're moving to the exact same role at a new institution, you may have a sense of what you can continue to do or not do. But being really clear with them about what your bandwidth is, how you might be able to continue to work together. And when you make those commitments, reliably engaging, reliably respond to emails and making sure you can keep those projects going. I recognize that my ability to move institutions is in part because I'm a health services researcher. So very little of the data that I have is protected health information. Very little of the equipment I have is much more than, than um, servers and, and um, software. So some of, some of the research productivity can lag, but I have to say as a health services person, I've been able to keep um, and publish most of the projects I start at one institution as a new institution. The last best piece of advice that I can give is you should take a break between places. So when you commit to a new job and you, you pick, you're setting up the starting date, Unless the whole reason you were hired was to fill a position on a certain date, give yourself a month, give yourself two months. These are built-in periods for you to move, reset your life, get a driver's license in a new state, register your car, go see your family, go to the beach. Once you're hired, people don't have a, a sense of what, when you're actually going to start. And it's a sort of built-in time for yourself, if you can afford it, to really, to really, um, acknowledge that this reset is happening and to make the most of it. The same goes for when, even when you're just leaving roles within an institution. So you're finishing fellowship to go to attending, um, how is, is probably the most common, take the time. There's no reason that they can't, that you can't stay, start later, unless the whole reason that you're starting this job is because, because of your initial availability. So going back to the map, I can't say what will happen next. Uh, my partner's finishing the, the end of hopefully the last few years of his training. And so it's possible that we'll have to move again. Where that, where that is, I, I can't say. But what I do know is I have a much fuller suitcase now than when I started. And I feel much more comfortable navigating the challenges of moving than I did at the beginning of my career. And I hope that you do the same. Uh, I put my, my name and email in the chat, but I'm always happy to, to connect with you. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.